Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to press the like button as well as the subscribe button if you haven't done so already and the notification bell which will alert you every time Plaster Rock United Baptist Church uploads a new video. And don't forget to visit our Facebook page as well as our website, plasterrockubc.weebly.com. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for braving the uh, elements and the weather to come out to be for uh, Sunday school this morning, and I hope that uh, you'll be blessed by your attendance. Uh, week before last, we started kind of a mini-series on uh, Genesis, and we're talking about the origins of Satan. And uh, it, it, it behooves us to understand our enemy, because when we understand our enemy, um, Paul said we shouldn't be ignorant of any of Satan's devices. So the better we know our enemy, the better we'll know how to live a good life before God and how to engage in spiritual warfare. And week before last, we brought up the subject of the four living creatures. And the four living creatures are uh, they're a type of they're a type of angelic being. Uh, sometimes they're they're sometimes they're shown with six wings. Sometimes they're shown with four wings. But there's four creatures, and they have four faces. One has the face of a man, the other a face of an ox, the other a face of a lion, one the face of an eagle. And it represents the entire uh, animal kingdom with the exception of deep sea creatures, because deep sea creatures represents that uh, other dimension, that other realm, that heavenly realm that we can't exist in without artificial means. The only time we we can go underwater is if we have scuba gear or we're in a pressurized submarine or what have you. Uh, so, other than the marine animals, the only animal left out of that representation of the four is um, is the reptilian kingdom. And so we learn from Genesis uh, three when it talked when we first get introduced to Satan as the serpent in the garden that that word for serpent has several different meanings in Hebrew, and it's all trying to point to this, this uh, heavenly origin of this creature. It's translated as serpent. It's translated as shining one. It's translated as fiery one. Uh, and uh, the, the, root, the Hebrew wor root word uh, reflects back on an angelic uh, ranking called the seraphim. And so they believe that uh, Satan was originally, sometimes he's called a cherub, a cherubim. Sometimes he's called a seraphim. But he was one of Sa one of uh, um, God's heavenly throne guardians, and we see the pagan cultures adopt this motif uh, when they um, talk about their false gods and the throne guardians of their false gods. They're usually portrayed with maybe a uh, the body of an ox and the head of a man, or the body of a lion and the head of a man, or what have you, and it's borrowing from what God has already established in the heavenlies. So these four living creatures, it was believed that there was originally five. So in any kind of kingly procession, you usually have a representative of the king or a guardian of the king at all four corners of his throne as it's being, you know, you know, uh, carted through the city or what have you. And there's always one that's ahead that announces. And there's one that's ahead that proclaims the coming of the king. And it's believed that Satan probably had this position uh, before he fell. And so there's four living creatures. It's believed and theorized that there were originally five. And uh, so that fifth face would be the face of a serpent or the face of a snake. Uh, so that's kind of reviewing a little bit of what we learned a, a few Sundays ago. And uh, so before we get into the rest of it, let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we open up your word and uh, are introduced to new things that uh, we may not be all that familiar with, it could be a little bit intimidating, a little bit daunting, a little bit scary, uh, simply because we're not familiar with it and it's just all fresh and new to us. So I pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds and help us as we read your word to know what your word is trying to say to us, that we can understand it and we can be able to apply it to our hearts and our lives and our minds. And Lord, we love you and praise you and ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. So as I said a couple Sundays ago, uh, every, every great story has a prequel. You know, you have the Lord of the Rings trilogy and the prequel to that was The Hobbit. You know, you have the Star Wars, the original Star Wars trilogy. They made prequels to kind of get, you know, catch you up. Now they're finishing the entire series by 
uh, you know, uh, going past what we originally knew from the 70s of Star Wars. So kind of in the same way, the scriptures is similar, where the scriptures has a prequel. And it's a little bit hard to find, and, and it's hard to dig out because it's just not right there in front of your face. Uh, it's, it's buried in the prophetic scriptures of Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel, and uh, it's, it's alluded to in the Genesis account. So in order to truly understand the origins of Satan, we have to go back all the way to the beginning, to Genesis uh, 1, uh, 1 and 2, which we're all familiar, familiar with that passage, but I'll just uh, read it anyway, just to kind of uh, set up a good background for us. So Genesis 1, 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was chaos and waste. Other translations say form and void. The earth was form and void, and darkness was up on the surface of the deep. And the Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God, was hovering over the surface of the waters. So even in the English, it kind of gives us this hint that the earth it was already in existence before God uh, uh, recreated it. Before the creation account that we read through Genesis chapter two and or chapter 1 and 2. And so it's a little bit mysterious because it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then boom, that was it. And then all of a sudden in verse 2, it's almost as if an unknown amount of time goes by. And all of a sudden now the earth was chaos and waste. Well, we know that God is a God of order. And God doesn't create anything uh, in a destructive manner. He always creates things good. The creation account said that every time he, he created something, it was good. It was good. And he came to mankind and it was very good. So God is not a God of chaos. God is a God of order. We see this reflected in the pagan literature. Uh, virtually all of them have a similar creation and flood account because we were all one people up till the Tower of Babel where our languages were, were confused and we went off into our 70 different people groups and 70 different nations. So uh, their creation accounts is talking about how their false gods have come down and destroyed this mythological creature called Leviathan, or called Tiamat, or Behemoth. And we even see Leviathan and Behemoth in the scripture, and it represents that primordial chaos. It represents, uh, you know, that, that destructive, uh, the destructive motif, the way the world was before uh, God recreated everything. And so usually these narratives end with this pagan god splitting the uh, creature of chaos in half and creating one part as heaven and the other part as the earth. So we can kind of see how the pagans are borrowing off of scripture because God comes into this, to this uh, world of chaos and he brings order to this chaos. Uh, so um, we have to get into the aspects of the pre-edemic earth to truly understand the origins of Satan, where he came from, why he's doing what he's doing. So now this pre-edemic earth uh, sounds very foreign and strange. Many people have never heard of it. I haven't heard of it until maybe about five, ten years ago. Uh, but I discovered that, uh, you know, the Schofield Bible, uh, if anybody has a Schofield Bible, you're going to find the commentary on Genesis 1, 1 and 2, and it's going to kind of talk about the pre-edemic earth. So Schofield believed it. Um, uh, Gary Stearman and uh, Steve Quayle and uh, Robert Dake and... Uh, Pemberton, they all talk about this pre-edemic earth and kind of go into detail and delve into the scripture. So we're going to kind of take notes from them and we're going to kind of uh, delve into what they had to say about it. Now, Gary Stearman, in his book, Time Travelers of the Bible, how the ancient prophets shattered the time barrier, because it talks about the things they seen that they were either in the future, they, they, they were projected into the future to see things and that's how they were able to prophesy on, uh, on what, was, uh, what was going to come to pass. And even uh, some of the prophets talk about being transported or translated or being brought somewhere else uh, and dropped down in the middle of this city or in the middle of this place into the future. So this is what Gary Stearman says. He said, concerning these verses, the old Schofield Study Bible, originally copywritten in 1909, has this footnote. Paraphrased, it reads as follows. Jeremiah 4, 23 and 26, Isaiah 24, 1, and Isaiah 45, 8 clearly indicate that the earth had undergone a cataclysmic change as a result of divine judgment. 
The face of the earth bears everywhere the marks of catastrophe. Many verses connect it, connect it with a previous testing of the fall of the angels. And so Gary Stearman goes on uh, to comment on this commentary, and he said, Schofield and others linked the fall of Lucifer with the destruction of the old world. This happened prior to the creation of the world in which Adam and Eve were placed as the first humans. In other words, the Garden of Eden existed in a recreated earth that, was, that had formerly been in a condition of chaos. Schofield quotes Jeremiah 4, 23 and 26, in which the same chaos described as in Genesis 1 and uh, verse 2. So I'm just going to stop right there. Uh, now, we may ask ourselves, why is it more detail given on this pre edemic earth? Well, for the simple fact, it's really not important to us. Because it really doesn't matter if one believes it or one doesn't believe it. It's not going to change our doctrine. It's not going to change our faith. It's not going to change our walk. But if we do understand about the pre edemic earth, we're going to understand about the origins of Satan. And as a result, we're going to be better prepared and better equipped to engage in spiritual warfare against Satan and his cohorts. So it's, it's nothing to be afraid of. It's nothing to shy away from. It's going to sound weird and strange because most of us have never heard it before, though it has been commented on by Christian philosophers, Christian commentators, rabbis, way back into the 1800s and even further. And so I gave a list of names of people who have talked about this, and a lot of uh, ministers are afraid to talk about this stuff in churches. Well, you should know by now that I'm not really afraid to uh, touch on any topic. If it's in the Bible and it talks about what we're going through or it's going to help us, I want to talk about it. I think it's important for us to know. So this is, um, so, okay, back to Genesis 1, 1 and 2. It says, the, this is kind of the way I paraphrased it from, from the Hebrew, uh, breaking down the Hebrew. This is the origins of everything. God created the various heavens and earth. Because there's a lot of plural and singular in the Hebrew that's really not fleshed out in English. Uh, so I'm wording it in a specific way according to the Hebrew. This is the origin of everything. God created the various heavens and earth. The earth became a chaotic desolation. Indistinguishable and, darkly, and dark obscurity was down upon the surface of the deeps. And the Spirit of God brooded over the surface of the waters. So the word create in verse 1 is the Hebrew word bara. And, you know, if you've watched any television or cartoons, uh, a lot of times you'll see magicians or people that know magic. They'll say abracadabra, right? That's actually borrowed from the Hebrew because this word abra is borrowed from the word bara in the Hebrew, which means uh, to create or to form. The implication of the Hebrew is to create out of nothing with an intelligent design. So if you take the word abracadabra and relate it to the Hebrew words, abracadabra literally means I create with my words out of nothing. So that's what the magicians are really saying when they say abracadabra. I don't know what alakazam is. I haven't looked that up. But abracadabra means I create with my words out of nothing. So we see that being borrowed from the Hebrew in Genesis 1. Uh, the word was in verse 2 uh, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was chaos. This word was means to become. That it wasn't originally created or formed in a chaotic state. That somehow it became chaos. It, it became void. Something happened that caused it to become this chaotic desolation. The word form in Hebrew is the word tohu, meaning desolate, worthless, empty, chaotic, Deserted, nothing, unreality. The word void is bohu. So the earth was, uh, was uh, without form and void. Tohu, bohu. The word void is bohu, and it means to be empty, to be an indistinguishable ruin. Now, sometimes we'll come up, up, up along something that's been destroyed, and we may not be able to tell what it is. It's been destroyed so much, it's basically just rubble and ash, and we're like, gee, this could have been a building, this could have been a car, this could have been a chair, this could have been anything. It's indistinguishable. You don't know what it is anymore. That's what it means. The word darkness in this passage means obscurity, misery. It means night, it means dusk, 
And the word upon in the Hebrew uh, has a meaning of pressing downward or against. So it says darkness was upon the surface of the deep. So the darkness pressed down upon the surface of the deep. There's kind of an implication of pressure, of weight there. If the earth was not originally created desolate, then it must have been created and later became desolate. Even the English word, English verb was proves that it had become desolate bef before, that it had become desolate before it was desolate. God only creates perfection. So the first earth had to be created perfect, complete, whole, habitable before it could be rendered a desolate, chaotic ruin. Isaiah 45, 18 says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, and he established it, and he created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. So it had to first be full of knowledge and light before it would become an obscure nothingness. To break down Genesis 1 verse 2 and throwing all the Hebraic implications of the language, you get something that sounds like this. The planet Earth wa that was, was snuffed out of existence and it became chaotic, desolate, a desolate place of indistinguishable ruin and unreality and was left in dark, unknown, miserable obscurity that was uninhabitable, and the chaos oppressed the surface of the watery abyss, and God's breath breathed over the watery, flooded earth. So throw in all the Hebrew words and what they mean, their various definitions, the implications, that's what you get out of Genesis verse 1 and 2. So let's look quickly at Genesis 1.28. Well, before we go there, I want to mention... Sometimes you have science that clashes with creationism. And I'm going to take what the Word of God says before what any PhD science uh, you know, physicist or whatever says. But they're, they, they purport that the earth is billions and billions of years old. But we know as creationists, what we see here and what we exist in, it can't be any more than 10,000 years old at the most. Even the Jewish calendar is said to be rendered from the beginning of time, and the, the, the Hebraic year is 5779. So, uh, you know, it's at least 6,000 years old, if not 10,000 years old. That's being very generous. But we have all of, these, all of these scientists saying, well, no, no, the earth is old. It's billions and billions of years old. We've performed this test, and we performed that test. If... The pre-Adamic earth is factual, and it is true. That would explain the discrepancy in modern science as opposed to creationism. Because if the earth had already existed before God recreated it from that desolate, chaotic void, then the earth would register as older than it really is. But since from the point where God recreated everything from this desolate chaos, this watery world that we see in Genesis 1-1, that's only been 6,000 years ago. 10,000 at the most, and that's being very generous. So um, if, if these scientists say that the earth is old, we could possibly be living on an older earth. And that, would, uh, you know, th th that wouldn't contradict the scriptures in any way. It would actually back up the scriptures if indeed the pre-Adamic earth is true. And again, it's one of these things where if you don't believe it, that's fine. You don't have to. It's not important to your faith. But if we're to understand who Satan is, where he came from, we got to kind of understand the origins of things because he fell during this time. This was when his fall was, and we may have inklings or hints or reasons for his fall that Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel give us, as we'll get into later in the lesson or in a future lesson, maybe next Sunday. So let us look at Genesis 128. The word replenish in the Hebrew. So let me, let's, uh, it says Genesis 20, uh, 128. It says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Replenish. Even the English word, it says replenish. If this was the first created order, he would said, fill it, plen you know, plenish it. He wouldn't say replenish it, replenish has that, 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 that connotation that it was filled up before. And now it's not filled up, so you have to fill it up again. So even the English lends hints and credence to this pre-edemic earth. 
So the word replenish in the Hebrew means both uh, to, to be at an end and to expire. And it also means to fill, to be fulfilled, and to replenish. So this Hebrew word that means replenish both means to come to an end, to come to an expiration. So this chaotic pre adamic earth was at its expiration date. It was done. It was finished. And the Hebrew word also means replenish, to fill up, to fulfill, and to replenish. So at the same time when it came to an end, there was nothing left. It was time to fill it back up again and bring it back to where it's supposed to be. So the implication is very clear. The first pre-edemic earth was expired, put to an end, and then the recreated earth was to be replenished and filled um, as it, the first pre-edemic earth, was plentiful prior to its watery destruction. The further hints that it was also inhabited uh, by reproducing animals and some form of humanoid life. So you have the implication that if it was filled before, it was, must have been filled with some sort of creatures, must have been filled with some sort of you know, intelligent uh, beings. Uh, we don't know what they, what they were. Or it's really not important. Uh, but for it to be replenished, it had to be filled up and plenished before. Okay. Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, Hebraically indicates without a doubt that there was a pre adamic earth created prior to the literal six-day recreated one that we live on now. All we know for certain from the Hebrew is that it was created and for some reason utterly destroyed and made uninhabitable. Now let's link this very briefly to what the Torah says. The Torah commands that if something is unclean, that twice, two times, you attempt to cleanse it with water. And if it is not cleansed by those two separate washings of water, then you have to cleanse it with fire. So if there was a pre earth and it was already dis uh, destruction and void and it was a watery planet, that would be the first washing of the world. Noah's flood would be the second washing of the world. And we already know what Peter says the future is going to bring. He says that the elements is going to melt with a fervent heat. So the earth is going to be destroyed again, but this time by fire. That would back up what God says in his own law. And God does not contradict his law. He doesn't supersede his law. He has bound himself by the very law he created. So all we know for certain from the Hebrew is that it was created and for some reason utterly destroyed and made uninhabitable. What we don't know from these first two verses of Genesis chapter 1 is, we don't know when the pre adamic earth was created or how long ago it was created. We don't know how long it existed prior to the destruction of the watery obliterated state. And we don't know why it was destroyed. And we don't know who or what inhabited it. And again, why does that matter to us here? It really doesn't have any pending on our doctrine. It doesn't have any pending upon our faith. It really doesn't matter. But the Bible did want us to know that there was something here before what we, what we experience now. This may cause some to champion the marriage of modern atheistic science and creationism of the earth that it is billions upon billions of years old. And maybe the earth is that old, but it would not be possible to know scientifically because the Hebrew is clear and that whatever, uh, whatever this pre adamic earth, whether humanoids, animal, technology, or civilization, it was utterly destroyed. So whatever existed on this pre adamic earth, we're not going to find it in archaeology. We're not going to find it by digging. We're not going to find it by science because the word tohu and bohu mean it was totally obliterated. It was unrecognizable. So we're not going to find any skeletons from this time era. We're not going to find any animals from this time era. We're not going to find any um, you know, uh, uh, architectural structures from this time era because the Hebrew is very clear that it was just totally obliterated to where it was unrecognizable. Leaving behind absolutely no trace evidence, therefore no artifacts or fossils would exist to be found. Sure, the elements are there, but it's in the raw and basic form. And if you dig up some ancient carbon or sodium, you wouldn't know or be able to tell if it was a pre humanoid, a pre animal, pre plant, pre chair, pre building. You just wouldn't know. 
So these two verses between Genesis 1, 1 and 2 and verse 3 are known to theologians as the gap theory. And it is named such because there was a creative gap between Genesis 1, 2 and Genesis 1, 3. Again, the time span of this obvious gap is unknown between the first pre-Adamic earth and the recreation of this present earth we live on now. So many scholars believe that the events that filled this gap is the angelic Luciferian rebellion in heaven. So far, we only have canonical scriptures uh, to go by in regards to the details of the pre-Adamic earth because Jasher, Jubilees, Enoch, and such apocryphal and pseudepigraphal literature start with creation and the subsequent fall of the third of the angelic heavenly host. So they don't even really give us any hint. The only indications of a pre adamic earth that we can glean from is from Genesis and from the, what the prophet said. And we'll get into those prophetic scriptures uh, either today or into the next session. Interestingly enough, if there were, in, okay, I already basically brought this out, but it's worth repeating again. Interestingly enough, if there were indeed two worldwide floods, the Luciferian or the pre adamic flood and the Noatic flood, that destroyed the earth, and according to Peter, 2 Peter 3, 3 through 13, this one will be destroyed by fire. This fits the pattern of the Torah, of the law, that when something has been corrupted and tainted and made unclean, one, one attempts to twice cleanse it by water, and if that doesn't work, it must be cleansed by fire. So there are other passages in the Old Testament scripture that speaks of the pre adamic earth and its destruction. Isaiah 14, 9, uh, you know, where uh, basically Satan becomes the Lord of the dead. Uh, Isaiah 14, 12 through 18. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. We're just gonna we're just gonna scratch the surface this morning. It's gonna be really difficult with the time that we have to really get in, into depth, but we have uh, other Sundays that uh, we're going to be able to cover this. So Isaiah chapter 14, starting with verse 12, it says, How you have fallen from heaven, O bright star, son of the dawn. How you are cut down to earth. You who made the nations prostrate. Uh, prostrate. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit up on the mount of meeting in the uttermost parts of the north. I will ascend above the high places of the clouds. I will make myself like El Yon, like the Almighty. Yet you will be brought down to Sheol. You'll be brought down to hell. You'll be brought down to the grave. That's what Sheol means. To the lowest parts of the pit. The lowest parts of the pit of Sheol is called Tartarus. And Tartarus is the abyss. It's the bottomless pit. It's where those rebellious angels were cast, uh, you know, after the flood. Uh, let's see. Okay, continuing on. Those who see you will stare at you, reflecting on what has become of you. Is this the one who shook the earth and made the kingdoms tremble? Who made the world and wilderness uh, destroyed its cities? Who never opened the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nations, all of them lie in glory, each in his own house. So in, all, in scripture and in Hebraic hermeneutics, a passage can have up to four meanings, four interpretations. The literal meaning, a meaning that is alluded to, an applicable meaning, and a spiritual mystical meaning. This is why passages such as Isaiah 9-6 can be talking about a prophesied earthly king as well as a future divine messianic king. So when that verse says, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, that was a literal prophecy given to a king. But we as Christians know it's an allusion to the Messiah. It applies to the Messiah. And so you'll have a lot of Jewish uh, uh, rabbis saying, well, this doesn't talk about the Messiah because we see it's talking about a very earthly king. And they're conveniently leaving out that they themselves know that these very passages have four interpretations. And the interpretation of a messianic king is a very uh, viable 
interpretation of that. But they're not going to let the Gentiles know about that. They want to make the Gentiles believe that they know everything about Scripture. And so therefore, they've looked at the Scripture and already have denounced it and said it can't apply to the Virgin Mary. It can't apply to Jesus. So that's not what it means because it's literally talking about a king. So every time you read the Scripture, just know that there's four viable interpretations for the passage. And all of them have to line up and agree for it to be a correct interpretation. Uh, so this passage, uh, this is why a passage such as Isaiah 9-6 can be talking about a prophesied earthly king as well as a future divine Messiah. And much the same way Isaiah 14, 12-18 speaks of the king of Babylon and likens him unto Hillel, or in other words in the Latin we know as Lucifer, also known as the fallen angel that we call Satan and the devil. Now the word Satan is just a Hebrew word, means the adversary, means the enemy. So Satan is not a proper name, it's, it's a title. This passage, if read carefully with the Hebrew, taken into consideration, and if one believes that the angelic rebellion took place between Genesis 1-2 and verse 3, then this means that the angel Hillel, Lucifer, was cast out of heaven where God resides down to the pre adamic earth where apparently nations of human-like beings lived and existed. Isaiah 14, 12, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how thou art cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations. And we're going to get into some exciting facts and exciting passages in the scriptures where we're going to take the Noadic flood and the pre adamic flood and put them side by side. And you'll be able to clearly see that they're two totally separate events, two totally separate things. On the surface, it may seem the same, but when you look into the details of the verses and of the Hebrew, it's totally different. And we'll get into that. Now, remember what Yeshua said based on the verse, Isaiah 14, 12. How thou art fallen from heaven, O Hillel, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How thou art cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations. Did not Yeshua say, I saw Satan fall like lightning? Remember he said that in the New Testament? I saw Satan fall like lightning. He was there. When Satan rebelled, he was there when Satan and his rebelling angels that sided with him was cast out of heaven. They fell, uh, they fell to this earth, and um, they were locked into linear time. It's interesting. The angels that didn't rebel, God can send them to any point, place, and time in history he wants. He can send angels into the future. He can send angels to grab somebody, snatch them, take them to the future, bring them back. Because they're in heaven. They're in the heavenly realms. They're in a different time zone, if you will. But when Satan and his rebellious angels fell, they were locked and forced into a linear time. That's why Satan is not omniscient. That's why Satan can't travel to the future. That's why Satan can only make educated guesses and allusions onto what could possibly happen in the future. But he's locked in linear time because he was cast down to the earth. His angelic rights, his angelic abilities, some, a lot of them was taken away. He's still a powerful being, to be, to be sure. But he was locked in this linear time, and he, and, and, and he doesn't dwell in eternity with God or with his holy angels. So he really limited himself in this fall. So the word fallen is the Hebrew word nafal, and it means to fall, to be prostrate, to droop, to be born, to fall away, to sink, to be overthrown, to be thrown, or to be cast down. By this word, we see that Hillel, Lucifer, was created. He was a created being. He has a beginning, and he will have a definite end. Uh... So he was born in heaven, according to Ezekiel 28, 14 through 15, the realm where God resides. He fell away through rebellion and was subdued, in other words, prostrated, and kicked out of heaven and cast down to the pre adamic earth. The word ground is the same as the word earth in Genesis 1.1. Now, in this passage in, in Isaiah that we're talking about, the word for nations is goy. And it means inhabited, people, populous, tribes. And of course, the word nations implies humanoid and non-angelic beings. 
So Schofield and a lot of other scholars and commentators, especially a lot of other rabbis, believe that Isaiah 14, the passage we just read, is, is talking about Satan's fall and talking about how this fall took place during the time of the pre-Edemic earth. The word son is ben, and in Hebrew, it could mean a literal son or a figurative son. So we have to take into context. So we know that God created the angels. So therefore, these angels are a type of son. They're symbolic or, or a figurative son. You know, like sometimes when somebody uh, has created something, like let's say they build a car, they'll call that car their baby because it's their creation. Or somebody makes a sculpture or a painting, you know, they, they almost treat it like a child. They protect it like a child. It's a, like a figurative part of themselves. And so all throughout Scripture, in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Job, it talks about these angels and the Hebrew uh, for that is B'nai Ha Elohim, meaning the sons of God. So in Job, we see the sons of God presented themselves before the Lord for inspection or whatever reason. He called them there, and Satan was among them, right? So he, so it's a figurative type of son. So the word son is been in Hebrew, and it could mean a literal or figurative son. And thus we establish the angels are figurative sons of God, according to Genesis 6, 1 and 2, and according to Job 1, 6 through 7, and Job 2, 1 and 2. Isaiah 14, 3, hath said in Hebrew, is to angrily huff with one's nostrils. That's what that Hebrew word means, hath said. So uh, Isaiah 14, 13, he says, I will ascend above the heights, the high places of the clouds. So Satan making this claim, he's angry. He's wanting to overthrow God. He's wanting to overthrow the heavenly host. And he does it with pride and with anger. Now, the word ascend means to mount and rise, to be lifted up or to be exalted. This implies that Hillel, his Hebrew name for Lucifer, was cast down to the pre edemic earth and planned a coup d'etat against the Lord, uh, against the God of heaven. My throne is in the Hebrew a royal throne, implying that Hillel, Lucifer, had a seat of power and ruled the pre edemic earth, and he intended to overthrow God and rule heaven as well. So we know Satan kind of had some power before he fell because he was God's right hand man, so to speak. He's the one who said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. God said you were one of the most beautiful angels that was ever created until pride was found in you, before pride was found in your heart and you were corrupted. Um, above the stars of God in Hebrew implies that he intended to rule over and command the princes or the angels of God also, the ones who didn't rebel with him. So in Daniel 10, 13, angels are referred to as princes. So angels have several different titles and names throughout scripture, depending on the context. They're called angels. They're called sons of God. They're called princes. They're called stars. And that's one of the reasons why God commands the children of Israel not to worship the sun, moon, and stars because these fallen angels took on this false deification and claimed that they were the God of the sun or the God of the moon or the God of the stars. And so when people worship these uh, 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 heavenly bodies, they were, actually rep they were actually worshiping these fallen angelic uh, beings that were behind this ruse of these false and pagan religions. I will sit upon the mount of coronations in the sides of the north. This implies Hebraically that he also intended to rule over God's divine council, uh, which is not God, nor human, nor angels, but other divine heavenly created entities, part of his royal court, if you will. Uh, they have been called angels, but the divine council, because when he says, let us create man in his own image, in our own image. He wasn't just talking about the Trinity. He wasn't just talking about the Godhead. He was talking about the divine council. And we can find more about the divine council in, I think it's Psalm chapter 82, which we'll get into at some point. Uh, so Satan not only wanted to rule over the angels, but over God's divine council. Um, let's see. Okay. So all these fallen angels are eventually what became these false gods that ruled over these nations because there were 70 nations. And in the scripture, and I'll try to find this at a different time, but God divided up the nations according, 
The King James says, according to the sons of Israel, but the older text that they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls says that they were divided, the nations were divided according to the sons of God. So whether you're talking about 70 sons of Israel or 70 you know, fallen angels, the sons of God, when, when there was the government set up in Israel, there were 70 elders. And these elders represented each of the nations of the world, the root nations of the world. So what these, these uh, fallen angels did after the fall, after the uh, Tower of Babel, and the languages were confused, they basically divide, divvied up the nations among themselves and rose up and became these false gods. And, you know, it's interesting where Jesus talks about, you know, where they're accusing him of casting out devils, you know, in the name of Beelzebub. Or that the prince, you know, by the prince of devils, by Beelzebub, he casts out demons. And Jesus says, how can, how can a, a kingdom fight against itself and still stand? Right? But that's what we see happening. If you look at all the mythos, all the mythology of the different pantheons, whether it's a Canaanite pantheon, whether it's a Babylonian pantheon, whether it's a Greek pantheon, whatever, an Indian pantheon, you'll see different times throughout histories, the different parts of the pantheon rising to power and becoming the prominent god of that era or of that time frame. So we do see that the fallen angels do fight amongst themselves to try to find the, superior, the superiority to be able to rule the pantheon. And of course, Satan is over all of them. They're not going to conquer Satan himself. But they fight amongst themselves to jockey for position. At one point, you know, Baal the storm god is, is, is the god of this particular era. And maybe in another era, it's Molech. You know, the God of the dead and the, and, the, and the God of sacrificing children. And then maybe in another era, it's, it's Ishtar or Inanna. And they're all fighting and jockeying for position. So these fallen angels, you know, they play nice with each other to, to, to mutually benefit each other. But ultimately, they're wanting control. Just as Satan wanted to control heaven. Just as Satan wanted to uh, overthrow God and become ruler over all. These fallen angels want to do the same thing among themselves. Because they're parading themselves off as these false gods of the various peoples of the world. And they're kind of jockeying for position. So we see, in, we see it detailed in the apocryphal and pseudepigraphal and extra-biblical literature of, of the books of Enoch especially. And Jasher and Jubilees. We, it, it lists these, these angels, the ones who rebelled, the ones who fell. Because just as uh, the, I think it's the Greek story where Prometheus brought fire, stole fire from the gods and gave it to mankind, right? I think it was Prometheus. And so uh, Satan is a type of Prometheus because Satan, Lucifer, means light bearer, the one who brings light. And so now you have a lot of the Illuminati, a lot of the Hollywood elite that is falling in league with Satan and they're claiming that Lucifer's the good guy. He's just misunderstood. Because after all, Lucifer brought us light. He's the light bearer. See how sick and twisted it is? But these fallen angels in the book of Enoch is listed bringing mankind forbidden knowledge they, they weren't supposed to know. Like how to make weapons of war. How to perform abortions. How to create psychedelic drugs. How to do all these evil things that men was never supposed to know. And so it's this forbidden knowledge. And it's coming to light today, just as in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. Back then, they were worshiping all these pagan gods. They were privy to all this hidden and forbidden knowledge that Satan brought them and his, his fallen angels brought them. And the same thing's happening today. History is repeating itself. So there's a list of, of 200 leading angels and an unknown number of subordinates that fell in the heavenly rebellion and fell to earth. And they divided themselves up among the nations to take controls of territory. But God said, I'm going to keep Israel for myself. And through Israel, I'm going to redeem all of the nations of the world through this. So uh, Psalm 82 verse 1 says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty and he judges among the Elohim. Remember how I said that the angels are called B'nai Ha Elohim, the sons of God? Well, this is what this is referring to, is the heavenly divine council of these angelic council members. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the Elohim, among the gods, among these angels who have rebelled and fell. And in Psalm 82, if you read the whole psalm, it just talks about how you're going to end up dying like men. You're, you're going to have some attributes of, of, of mortality, and you will be defeated. So uh, Dr. Michael Heiser 
has uh, written a tremendous book uh, that gives way more detail than I could ever go into regarding the divine council, and it's called The Unseen Realm. It's his book, The Unseen Realm. Okay, so we're gonna, I'm going to try to finish up with Isaiah 14 here, and then we'll pick up in Ezekiel next week. Isaiah 14, 14 says, We'll be like... This tells us that Hillel, Lucifer himself, knows and admits that he is finite, limited, created being, and not infinite, not omniscient, not omnipotent, not omnipresent like Yahweh, like God, but will, at best, resemble, be as close as possible as he can be to God Almighty. That was his aspiration. Isaiah 14, 15, hell is the word Sheol, and in Hebrew, this means the depths, the abyss, the netherworld, the realm of the dead, the subterranean, and the word pit means hole, cistern, dungeon, or grave. For the king of Babylon, it meant his death. For Hillel, for Lucifer, it meant he will lose his power, rulership, and authority over the pre earth. On the one hand, it hinted at the pre earth's watery destruction, and on the other hand, hinted at the ultimate end of Satan, as mentioned in Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, and Revelation 20, verse 10. They shall say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. The devil and, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Isaiah 14, 16 through 17, these verses imply, as did verses 12 and 13, that the pre world was inhabited and had civilizations and nations and kingdoms that Lucifer corrupted and turned against God. Perhaps along with the fallen angels, Lucifer mounted a rebellion with the inhabitants of this pre earth, and uh, like unto the rebellion of man that we read about in Genesis 11, 1 through 9, in the account of the Tower of Babel. In verse 16, the word man is not Adam, meaning human, but simply meaning a male or masculine persona, meaning that Lucifer is a masculine spiritual entity. So we see all, you know, every time in Scripture when it talks about the sons of God, sons, right? A male personage, the sons of God. So the, the angels are created patriarchal masculine. But yet, for some reason, in the Renaissance paintings, we see these, these angels created that look like women or that are women or that are these fat babies that they call cherubs. That's just totally fictitious and false. Has nothing. It's not rooted in the Bible at all. Uh, verse 17 implies the reason that the pre earth was utterly obliterated. Lucifer corrupted and turned the inhabitants against Adonai, their creator, and rebelled. We see in verse 18 the implications that the pre kingdoms was once something to behold. Glory means that they once had honor and esteem. Everyone is the Hebrew word ish, and it also means man or husband. So it implied that they were human-like, and each kingdom was unique in its culture and tradition. In verses 19 through 20, it's talking about a family burial plot, saying that the king of Babylon will not be buried with honor. And for Lucifer, it implies he, he is immortal and will exist in all eternity in eternal punishment in the lake of fire, as said in Reve uh, Revelation 20.10 and Matthew 25.41. It is theorized that because some of the fallen angels cohabitated with women in Genesis 6, 1 through 7, and were punished and chained... In the abyss, according to Jude 1 6, and that some of what we call demons or unclean spirits or familiar spirits are not just the remaining fallen angels, but these disembodied spirits of these fallen pre Adamic people, as well as these, these dead giants that these that the, the angels created cohabitating with the earthly women in Genesis chapter 6. And you see this backed up. In the uh, writings of Justin Martyr and writings of other church fathers and other rabbis, that what we know as demons are not just these fallen angels. These fallen angels are the false gods. These demons or the, these daemon are familiar spirits. They're unclean spirits. The, you know, uh, when, when uh, um, Satan was disputing over the body of Moses, you know, he wasn't called a demon. He wasn't called a devil or an unclean spirit or what have you. He was, he was still recognized in an angel and respected as such, even though he was fallen. But the only time that, that the familiar spirit or unclean spirit 
is attached to a word or to a being, it's, it's implying that these fallen, disembodied spirits that are neither human nor angel, therefore they have no place in God's creation. They're an abomination. So a lot of the early church fathers and a lot of the rabbis and sages believe that these demons are two things, the disembodied spirit of these pre adamic people that rebelled against God, and these giants, these Nephilim, that were destroyed in the flood when all the giants were wiped out, and that they were these these, these offspring of the combination of human women, the sons of God and the daughters of men. Um, because seeing as these pre adamic spirits and these, uh, these post-flood Noah, uh, Nephilim spirits, no longer have a body, they desire to possess others in order to feel and experience and fulfill their lustly, lustful, sinful desires, such as murder, gluttony, sexual perversion, and the like. Have you always wondered why a demon wants to inhabit a body? That's why. They can only think about the evil things they want to do. They can't taste, they can't touch, they can't feel, they can't do any of that. They need a body to actually experience the physicality of these things. That's why these demons want to possess bodies so desperately. And so, you know, um, but again, it's only speculation and based on these passages and cannot be definitively de proven on the basis of can canonical scripture alone. So we're going to stop right there and pick it up with Ezekiel 28 next week that talks a little bit more about the pre adamic earth, talks a little bit more about the fall of Satan, who he was, why he rebelled, and what he's like. So I, knew, I know I threw a lot at you, but does anybody have any questions before we close? Or is your head going to explode? I don't know. I think we got some duct tape in the back. We can wrap your head up if you need to. Okay, let's go ahead and close in, in a word of prayer. Lord, I know this is a, a really dicey, maybe even a, a controversial subject to most, but Lord, if your word talks about it, we want to explore it. If your word talks about it, and we need to know it, and it's beneficial for us in the long run, we don't want to shy away from it. I know that pastors a lot of times will, will go by scriptures and be preaching a message and they'll leave out the most important part of the scripture because they don't want to touch it. They're afraid to talk about it. They're afraid of the implication of what it means. But Lord, uh, you know, we want to get down to the nitty gritty to what your word says and the truth of your word. And so Lord, help us to understand and know what your word is trying to say to us so we can apply it to our hearts and to our lives and to our minds. And Lord, we love you and praise you and ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. The Plaster Rock United Baptist Church. Come join us every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. The Plaster Rock United Baptist Church. Find us on social media on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter.